Well, good evening. If we can take just a few seconds and, uh, and just sit quiet, maybe close your eyes for a minute and relax and breathe deeply. Listen to the sound of your breath. The sound of breathing is the first and it is the last sound that you make when you enter and when you leave this earth. It's a sacred wind, a sacred sound. You can open your eyes. the sound of breathing, the breath. You know, what we find out, you know, there's no, no crow way of breathing. There's no Lakota way of breathing, no Cheyenne way of breathing. There's no white way of breathing, no black way of breathing. There's no Indian way of breathing. My good friend, my late good friend, Corbin Harney, we helped him uh, acquire a, a healing place in Death Valley, Thermal Hot Springs. Um, he was Shoshone, and he used to say, there's only one water, and there's only one air. And we know this as a divine wind, a divine wind that binds us all together as humans, as plants, as animals. It binds together all of our relations. And it demonstrates that we are all connected. There is connectivity. And there's no species. There's no religion, there's no political force that can control the sacred wind, the sacred wind that connects us. It is connectivity. And we'll talk a little bit about connectivity tonight. So let's set that aside. First of all, I'd like to um, thank the Crow people who's region whose territory whose homelands that we're in I'd like to thank the spirits of this land for allowing me to speak and for allowing each of us to be here in good health good spirit and to be with us this week in this this time of learning this time of exploration my name is chris peters i am puli claw in Pechikla, or Yurok in Karuk, in literal translations, is up the river and down the river, no matter which language you put it in. I'm downriver Indian and I'm upriver Indian. And that's how we orient ourselves on the river. Uh, my tribes have called Northwestern California homeland since our inception. We, we are earth healing and earth renewing people. We have a philosophy, we have a religious theology that is founded upon the concepts of healing and renewing the earth. We have elaborate ceremonies to do that. And we conduct these ceremonies on an ongoing basis. It's our understanding that we were put here on earth for no other reason other than to heal and to renew the earth. That's why we exist as human beings. That's our purpose in life. And like many 
other tribal nations, we practice what is called an earth-based spiritual belief system, an earth-based spirituality. And that is also a connectivity with other indigenous peoples, not only here in the United States, but of the world, that we are earth-based spirit people. We understand that. The emphasis, you know, we practice an earth-based spirituality and the emphasis is put on practice. We practice, we experience that spirituality on an ongoing basis. We don't, it's not a spiritual concept that's relied on dogma, that's not relied on teaching from a book. It's, it's a spirituality that exists throughout time on practice that we practice and experience spiritual understanding. And from that knowledge, from that experience, has evolved a purpose in life and how we live. This practice, and many of you have this practice as well, is to seek and foster harmony by overcoming conflict and opposition of oppositional energies. That's our purpose, that's our religion, that there is an oppositional force of energy. There is a need to establish and maintain harmony within the world, within ourselves as human beings, and within the universe. And you know, we used to think that's a pretty lawfully undertaken for a people to have to establish and maintain peace and harmony as a peoples. But that's a responsibility of indigenous peoples all over the world, and it's a responsibility of humans all over the world, is to maintain harmony, to maintain peace to heal and to renew the earth on an ongoing basis. That's why we are all put on earth as two-legged people, is to heal and renew the earth. Like many tribes, you know, we in Northern California, we have lost a lot of this tradition, a lot of this understanding. But over the last 40 years, we have been doing research we have been doing explorations, and we have been visiting sacred places to try to renew that concepts, that understanding. We've been working to revision, re-envision who we are as peoples to recreate ceremonies. And likewise with native peoples throughout the United States, since the 60s and 70s, I know many of you have been equally taken with this task of going to your communities, going back to your communities, talking to your spiritual leaders, and trying to recover and to re-envision who we are as Native peoples, to try to figure out how do we fit into things as Native peoples, our purpose in the world. And some of us have been very successful. Some of us need a lot of work yet. And in Northern California, we're probably sitting on, 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 on the, somewhere in between that process of needing to understand and needing to develop this, these systems again. My topic tonight is cultural identity for community organizing. You know, Bonnie always gives me these easy topics to talk about. So. <laughs> And I'll try to stick with this. You know, we'll look at cultural identity from a small micro perspective and a macro perspective. And we'll examine community organizing from an intertribal and an interspiritual context. And we'll talk a little more about connectivity. This connectivity, I think, is an important concept that, uh, that we should understand a little better, how we're connected. Uh, because our Lakota folks, you know, tell us quite oftenly 
that we should thank all of our relations. And that's certainly an important message, that we are all related, not only humans, but everything. On Earth, there is a relationship. There is a connectivity uh, that we maintain. And we'll talk a little bit about the need for social change, social transformation on a larger context. But I'm, you know, these are broad topics I'll cover quickly. I'm not going to keep you here all night. So these are big topics. I think we can open the door to some of these conversations. And throughout the week, hopefully, we can begin to have some more conversations individually and, and collectively. You know, last year we talked a little bit about identity, and that was, again, some of our context. You know, why is it important to have a, a, a Cheyenne-specific personality? You know, because we know Cheyennes are different than Lakotas, they're different than, than Crow, they're different than, than any other people in the world. They're Cheyenne. And that uniqueness of their identity makes them very special, very unique people in the world because they have a specific personality, a specific way of behaving and understanding and looking at the world from that perspective. It's a specific personality that only they have. You know, the Strengthening the Circle Native Nonprofit Leadership Program, you know, the theme tonight or this week is going to be in keeping with my topic. The theme is Native identity in our leadership and our youth. Native identity. You know, and, and I challenge each of you to look closer at your own specific identity, your own tribally specific identity throughout the year, because that's an important part to begin. Uh, change within your community and social change within the world it has to come from somewhere. It comes from who you are, your identity. We set some very lofty goals for this week. It's in your book, but you know we hope to to build capacity of of nonprofit organizations, staff, and board, um, so that there are more resources, networks and services for youth and families. We'll reinforce knowledge about traditional ways of leadership and governance. In today's conversation, we'll talk about that a little bit, about leadership. And we'll develop culturally appropriate training materials uh, to build um, the base of support available to Native nonprofits. And here, we're going to depend on you. You know, we're going to throw out a lot of concepts this week. We have in the past. And we began to get feedback to help shape those resources, those those, that strategy for development in your community. And, you know, you are the resource that we have, the feedback that we have to ensure those, the things that we produce are valid, that they work. So please don't be shy. You know, speak up. You know, I've been with Seventh Generation Fund now. This May, it's going to be going on my 25th year. Very long time. Seventh Generation Fund's been around for about 35 years, and we've been working with Native communities throughout the United States, throughout Central and South America. And Virgil here is one of the founders. So certainly thank you for his presence here, being with us, and uh, you know, he's been around a long, long time. <laughs> you know, the concept, the basic precept of Seventh Generation Fund is a precept held by many different tribes, in that each, in, in, in each of our deliberation, in each of our conscious thought, we consider the impact on seven generations to come. You know, to give some thought to how we behave, how we think, for seven generations from today. It teaches us how to be good ancestors. You know, to be able to think in terms of many generations forces us 
us to think about what we're doing and how we act and how we behave today so that it will have an impact. How we think and believe will have an impact on seven generations from now. But let's kind of put things in context. You know, seven generations in the future. The future is by definition filled with uncertainty. And particularly at this time in history that we live in today, that uncertainty is there. And to a certain extent, it's uncontrollable. Things are moving fast, moving quickly. It's filled with mystery. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how things are going to, going to, going to turn out. And with each of our traditions, there is some concepts, some consideration, and perhaps even mandates that require us to look at future generations. We're obligated as indigenous people to not only think of ourselves, but think about the unborn that will occupy this, this world, you know, such as seven generations. You know, our tribes, many of our tribes, have people who know how to do vision quest, to have vision. They're seers, they're philosophers, they're prophets. They can predict to a certain extent events to come. They have the ability to go into the mountains, to fast, to pray, to meditate, and interpret the sacred will of creation. But even for them, the future in today's world, there's a lot of uncertainty. Not so much different than seven generations ago, 150 years, that uncertainty for our people was scary. That uncertainty for our people not knowing what's going to happen as they had survived at that point, maybe 150 years of continuous warfare. But they took the obligation seriously. They took it to heart. And if they didn't, we wouldn't be sitting in this room today. And if they didn't, we wouldn't believe what we believe today. So no matter how uncertain that future is, you know, certainly we challenge each other to consider what we do and how we act and how we behave. Consider what that impact might be for seven generations today. That's our obligation. That's why we organize. That's why we do what we do. The unpredictable future is scary. There's no way that our ancestors could ever imagine what we Crow or Yurok or Cree or Lakota or Navajo would be thinking and doing at this point in time in history. But they made provisions to make sure that we were thinking Indian thoughts. Some would have been proud. Perhaps others would have been embarrassed, ashamed, and even disgusted. You know, what the hell are these people thinking? Approving those mining contracts, those water compacts, you know. This or that, that development plan and strategy. And what about all of those damn casinos? You know, they would be embarrassed, they would be disgusted on what we'd be thinking and doing now, our development plan. And they would be disgusted to a certain extent of the bitter infighting and political battles that many of our tribes are going through on an ongoing basis. Certainly not the, not the future they may have envisioned for us. 
and hopefully it's not the future that we can envision for seven generations from today. The earth is threatened. The earth is imperiled. And by human action, you know, the earth has been brought closer to the brink of destruction than ever before in the history of humankind. There's been more extinctions in our lifetime than there has been since the Ice Age. And that level of extinction is increasing on a daily basis. But on the other hand, you know, our ancestors may have been proud that many of us are committed and continue our ceremonies, our languages, and our traditions. The practice of our spiritual belief systems, they have been, they have been proud of us for our continued pilgrimages into the mountains into Bear Butte, Black Hills, into Badger Two, into Crazy Mountains. They've been proud of us for reaching out and fasting and sacrificing and to be able to look for vision, direction. And they would have been proud of us for all of the hard work that we do in our communities and the search for ways of healing and renewing the earth. But no matter how unpredictable the future is, we still, as com at the community level, continue to plan and to put in place many protections, cultural systems that will build happiness, that will build life support for generations to come. That's what we do. And for many of us, this is why we do what we do. That's why you've come to Bozeman to understand the process, to be able to do it better, to begin to plan and project, to begin to set systems in place where our communities will survive, our communities will be happy, our communities will prosper. And that's why we do what we do. That's why we work for countless hours, weeks, months, and years in our communities and not giving up. Working toward a common interest, toward common goals that imagine and create a better future. A better life that we define in the context of our traditions and our worldviews and the communities where we live. And all of these are very good, very sound reasons for what we do and why we do it. We, we address issues of poverty and education and health and social services. We build cultural institutions. We protect our traditions. That's what we do. We're building a life support systems to sustain us through hard times because each of us know, unfortunately, we, our populations are often found in the lowest of the lower socioeconomic conditions throughout in, of all of the, 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 the indicators. And that's where we are as indigenous peoples. But let's step back. Let's step back further. Let's step way the hell back and began to put this into further context. Where are we now? Where are Native peoples now within the much larger picture? And how do we fit in? You know, in 1923, there was this guy by the name of Edward Hubble. Many of you might have heard of him. He created a telescope a telescope, a very powerful telescope that looked beyond what we could see, looked beyond the, the Milky Way. 
And what he's seen, and what they estimated, was something around 100 billion galaxies out there. 100 billion galaxies. And today, with the German supercomputer, they suggest that this number may in fact exceed 500 billion galaxies out there. And where are we on Earth? The magnitude of things are huge, bigger than huge. 500 billion galaxies, and that's with the big B. And within these 500 billion galaxies, there are hundreds of billions of suns, like our sun. Hundreds of billions of suns out there. Huge, huge. You know, so humans, peoples, Navajos, Crows, Lakotas, Yurok's, you know, we begin to shrink even smaller. But that's what's out there. And we still don't know what is yet beyond humans' ability to see, predict, or even imagine what might be out there. Countless, endless space. <coughs> And I don't want to get into issues of creation because that'll take me down another road and don't know where it might end up. So let's not deal with ideas of Big Bang and, and uh, immaculate conception <laughs> and other things. But, uh, you know, we'll leave that up to um, individual conversations. But our mother, the earth, the mother of the earth, in terms of, of, of a scientific perspective, is about 4.5 billion years old. That's how long this rock has been floating around in space. 4.5 billion years. Life, as is predicted, you know, it's about, and we're talking about microscopic, tiny, single cell, very brief life forms have been on Earth for at least 3.8 billion years. And what has been surmised after the last major asteroid that hit the planet that wiped out the dinosaurs, that human beings emerged about 60 million years ago. Archaeological findings, you know. Not just one species of humans, but many species of humans. And over a period of times of ice age and feast and famine and, and whatever that transpired, the last man standing was a certain types of human beings that, that were connected to somehow, you know. And again, let's not get into creation uh, and certainly respect the creation stories of many of us and how we came about. Um, since that time, scientists suggest that there is an estimated 106.5 billion people that have lived and shared this earth. 106.5 billion people have lived and died here on Earth. And these are just predictions or estimates. With a significant majority of people, of humans, coming on Earth in the last 200 years, we have now in excess of 7 billion people living and sharing the resources on Earth. And of course, some people have been taking more than others. You know, there are takers and there are givers. And some people take their share and take a little more too. And some take, one take a lot of it. But um, seven billion people. Indigenous peoples, they're estimated, a conservative estimate, maybe about 650 million people, opposed to seven billion. We're a little bit smaller. And 1.5 to 2 million that have identified themselves as being American Indian or Alaska Natives. So we're getting down population-wise a little more. And of course, each of you have your own enrollment figures, and some of them may be high and some of them very minuscule. So we fit into things as Crow, as Lakota, as Cheyenne, as Cree, 
we fit into things very marginally, very marginally. And over the past 10,000 years, there have emerged what is known as civilization, civilization. And with this civilization, strange things start to happen. And I won't go into a lot of deal and a lot of descriptions about the strangeness of civilization, but let me focus on a couple of things. After so many, many thousands of years of a spiritual understanding, of, of a harmony-based understanding, of a mystic understanding that every human population knew to be true, an understanding that the earth, our mother, was alive and had a spirit and had a soul, and that we were all rooted here, that we came from earth, and many of us would venture to say we are animals of the earth, that we are people of the earth. That's where our spirituality is based. That's where we understand we are from. This was being replaced with a more structured, more secular religious institution. And these religious religions, and we'll call them sort of Abrahamic religions, a lot of the Christian religions and things, they believed a different thing. They believed in a creator God, a creator God, a God that, was, that, that single-handedly was responsible for magically bringing things forth, bringing all of creation forth. Now, if you can imagine that, just imagine that you're, you're at home and all you had to think is, hey, food's going to be in the pantry, food's going to be on the table, and boom, it was there. Likewise with the creator God, all you had to do was think that all of the species of the world, all of the plants and animals, all of the humans, all of the rocks, all of the oceans and rivers can magically appear and there it's there. Some 80 to 90 percent of the people of the world believe that. That, like that, it's there within a period of time. And some say, suggest even that happened less than 10,000 years ago. <clears throat> This, somehow this civilized human also began to understand that they had a special relationship with this creator God, that they had a relationship, that they were particularly important in that relationship with that creator God, that God or the creator was there in their image. And that because God created things sort of magically, there was an issue in terms of the, in theology called dualism. That God, because he created things, was separate and distinct from all other creation different quite significantly than indigenous peoples and what people some 50, 60,000 years before that understood that we are from here, that we are rooted and based here. We understood the need to be in relationship and connectivity with all that is alive and that they were our relations, that somehow now there's a separateness that we are not a part of that creation, that we are separate. We are more important than that, than all of the other creatures, all of the other life forms, that we are separate. The notion strayed significantly from Earth-based understandings that had survived since the emergence of conscious humans that had continuously adhered to a harmony-based belief system, that understood connectivity, the relationship with all things that are alive, an understanding that sought to maintain balance and order in ourselves and the universe. We were connected to Earth's spirit, and this structured, the secular concepts of religion begins to tear us away from that concept. 
to move us away from that connectivity that many of our religious systems today still adhere to, our belief systems that are truly indigenous understood that we are related to creation, that we are rooted here in this earth. As time passed, the civilized man began to realize you know, his self-awareness, his intelligence, somehow distinguished him from other species, most notably his ability to problem solve, identifying cause and effect and the separation of mind and matter created a fundamental shift in this civilized human consciousness, particularly as it relates to Earth. The notion of an organic living and spiritual universe held by all cultures of the world was being replaced with the notion of a world without a soul, that it could be manipulated, it could be mined, it could be torn apart, it could be used for human benefit, that the earth had no soul, the earth had no spirit. Humans, the civilized human, had severed their roots from the spirit of the earth, had severed their roots from all of creation. And in due time, the civilized man was able to out-compete all competitors for available resources and eventually extend the notion of civilization to almost every corner of this planet. And that's what we are saddled with today that notion of civilization. In the far reaches of Earth time, that 4.5 billion years, humans have only been on Earth for a short period of time, and the duration of civilized man, civilization, has only been on Earth a split second, a blink of the eye, if you will a blink of the eye in that broad, extensive time period of Earth time. Civilized man has only been here a short period of time. But during this time, we've managed to screw things up pretty good, right? And I say we because indigenous peoples, you know, we've been a part of it too. You know, we're a part of it. We've signed those contracts, and we've been a part of it as well. We've overshot a lot of the fragile ecosystems. We've caused them to come out of balance. And the purpose of harmony-based spirituality, of course, is to keep things in balance. Those natural systems must be maintained in balance. We contaminated the sacred. We violated natural law and brought the earth, our common mother, to the brink of destruction. We have polluted the air, the sacred, the divine wind. We have polluted it. We've contaminated the oceans and the rivers, and we've destroyed the forest. There are, there are huge sections of the ocean that are dead, that has no ability to create and support life. There are many rivers that don't make it to the ocean, Colorado River, because we have used and abused those, those river streams. And we have less than 5% of old growth forests still standing on Earth. And some predict if it wasn't for the Pacific Ocean, they would be still cutting trees. The only thing stopped them was the ocean. If left to their own desire, civilized man will continue to consume and destroy all that is good, all that is sacred in the world. We have violated natural law, natural systems, and now all humans will suffer some consequences. The infringements of natural law is unforgiving. We know that the ice is melting. The ice is melting. As we enter this history of galactic dawn for you know, the Mayans, the third millennium, 
You know, we're presented, the humankind is presented, and perhaps Earth's spirit is presented with a very serious dilemma. Will the development strategies of the civilized human continue to sustain us, or will the competition for power and resources lead us to escalating conflicts, depletion of natural systems, and our eventual extinction? That's where we are. We're at the crossroads. Human life is at the crossroads. What has been transpiring is unsustainable. Some predict at least three to four other Earths, other planets the size of Earth, needed to sustain our consumption, human consumption, if we're going to, be, going to survive. We don't have three or four planets the size of Earth. All we have is what we have. And the way we're using the resources, the way we are consuming, it's unsustainable. Everybody knows that. I'm not telling you things that you don't know. Everybody knows and understands it, that our life is unsustainable. And this is one hell of a dilemma. You know, to be able to plan and predict and to give considerations for seven generations to come, that's what, that is our task, that is our dilemma. How do we go about that? How do we keep adherence to that earth-based spirituality and that important task of planning and divisioning and to seeing, you know, what we do today will have an impact on seven generations from now? And how do we make decisions that will ensure there will be adequate life support systems, clean air, clean water? How do we ensure that, that we can have heat in our homes to, to warm our children that are not yet born? How can we make decisions today to ensure that there will be food on the table that is not genetically modified or created somehow? You know, that's a dilemma that we are faced with. And certainly in each of our communities here in Montana and South Dakota, you know, North Dakota, Wyoming, Oregon, Washington, there's no free pass. You don't have to think about these things. You can just go on. You know, these are important things before us that we need to be forefront in our mind in how we put together organizations. You know, the dilemma is sort of an environmental or an economic, you know. Do we hope for an economic collapse so the environment be survived? Or do we hope an environmental collapse so the economy so, well, nothing will survive that, I guess, but, you know, that's, that's a strange dilemma. But it's a responsibility of indigenous peoples. Recently, the financial house of cards, the global financial industry, uh, industry you know, that have existed with accountability of peoples of the world capped an unsustainable cycle of greed and corruption and left the world near financial collapse and bankruptcy. This happened, you know, recently in our lifetime. We've all watched news. We understood that we were on the brink of bankruptcy and continue to be in, in, in how economies are connected throughout the world and we look at financial collapse and bailouts happening yet today. Our homes, our pension plans, our investments were gambled away. Ordinary people like you and I, our tax money was used, was hijacked, to bail out the perpetrators, the predators that got us in that predicament. None were prosecuted. None were jailed. None were held accountable in any fashion. Many of them got bonuses. People are losing faith in the power structure. Not only Indian people, but people throughout the world are losing faith in this house of cards, that it won't continue. And that's scary. That's an unpredictable, scary future. 
They don't trust him anymore. They don't trust him anymore because they've lost too much. We realize that wealth and financial power has shifted hands to a very tiny majority, minority of people. Perhaps 1% of the population now own about 85% of the world's wealth. 1%. Their mentality of this elite group of civilized human beings is to take no prisoners and give nothing back. The upper middle class is realizing the dividing line is now even above their economic status. You know, you look at this on a graphic chart, you know, they're flatlined it until it gets down to two and three percent of the population and then it shoots straight up. Because that's where the wealth is. That's where the money is. And the majority of the world's people, the seven billion people of the world, have nothing. And that's reality that I'm sure each of you have heard on television, have seen that there is quite a disparity. But it's produ producing a shift. You know, Occupy Wall, Wall Street, the Arab Spring. You know, people are realizing they have to do something. You know, the Occupy Wall Street movement, movement a half a billion hits on Google in a period of one month after their inception. So the word is spreading. You know, it may not happen in our lifetime, but change is happening. You know, we can't tolerate that type of corruption, that type of concentration of wealth, that type of poverty throughout the world, throughout our home communities. It won't be tolerated. You know, certainly Idle No More has become an issue with the Native communities, you know, bringing some attention to what's going on out there. You know, and Facebook, if any of you on Facebook, you know, Idle No More is all over. You know, maybe even more than the the, the basketball players, I'm not sure, but, you know, close. Uh, people are getting tired. You know, these oppositional movements are gaining force. You know, there's got to be another way. You know, certainly the issues coming out of Cochabamba, the Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth, the Constitutional Amendments of Ecuador, making provisions for the rights of Mother Earth. In many cities and towns in the United States, I think the last count was at 42, were adopting policies that inserted the rights of Mother Earth in their dealings. So awareness is happening. Awareness is building. You know, last year in Bozeman, here, Seventh Generation Fund and Hopa Mountain, we convened a discussion on climate change. It was a fantastic discussion. And you know, there's, there's a video out. I encourage you to take a look at it. You know, great conversations begin to raise some of these issues of climate change, but not only of climate change, other aspects of the world in crises were there. In this convening, there was a Crow gentleman, I forget his name. He made a challenge. He said, Skins, you got to get in the game. You know, Skins got to make a plan. We got to put together a team, and we got to get in the game. You know, we can't just sit silently and let things go by, that we have to get in the game collectively. And he was forceful. I enjoyed his conversation. You know, Warren Lyons was there, and he encouraged us to reach out and to begin educating people, to talk about these issues, to bring it to the forefront of conversations, to be persistent. And our responsibility as skins, we need to make sure people understand these issues. You know, what's the plan? How do we organize it? In early 90s, 
seventh generation fund was approached by the Elmwood Institute. And the Elmwood Institute, you know, they're subatomic physicists. They understand quantum physics. They understood string theory and particle science and theory. And, you know, who's wondering why they're approaching us? String theory. You know, there's a guy, Fujav Capra, many of you probably have heard of him. He published a couple of books about the same time. One was The Turning Point. That we have reached, human population had reached a point when they were just damn right fed up with the direction of things. And this was on masses. And he understood system theory. So he doesn't have to convince everybody. You only have to convince a certain number of people before they start to believe. And when systems begin to fall, natural systems fall rather quickly. And as we can see in, in the ecological situations, when natural systems fall, they fall and they connect to other systems that fall too. He says social systems are not much different. When social systems start to fall, when this mechanistic way of thinking and development begins to fall, then it's going to trigger other systems to fall. And what will emerge, what is emerging from that, is an ecologically based thinking, an ecological mindedness that understands, that understands and believe in harmony based understandings, harmony based spirituality. And these quantum physicists, they were stumbling upon concepts of connectivity. Connectivity. How we are all related. You know. So they, they ask, Seventh Generation Fund to help put together a conversation with these physicists. And my task was to put together an agenda and, and gather some traditional people together, some spiritual people, that, talk, that, could, that could talk about these concepts. We duped this convening. The role of native spirituality in social transformation. You know, these physicists understood that native peoples had a concept, a belief system, an understanding, a knowing that we are all related. That we understood connectivity more so than any other people. And they've asked us to come on board and have these conversations with them. So, you know, certainly they talked about string theory and subatomic physicists, and we talked about spirit. And somehow there was a gelling of that conversation because we may have called it different, named it different, colored it different, but what we're talking about were the same things. We were talking about spirit and connectivity. We were talking about particle, particle physics, quantum physics, but they were, the, they were the same thing. The role of native spirituality and social transformation. Now these subatomic physicists, you know, maybe starting back as far back as Einstein, were finding out the sacred wind, the breath, was not just empty air, was not just empty air, but in fact was comprised of tiny, tiny particles that were building blocks for all that exist, that, that building blocks for matter, for things in the world, for humans, for animals, for plants, for rocks, for planets, for solar systems, for galaxies. They were building blocks and that we were all connected to these building blocks. At the very core, at the very core of our spiritual practices, our understanding of the world, we had and, and we still have a process of knowing that we are all connected, that we are all related, and that we have this process, this, this esoteric process in each of our cultures of finding out, to vision, to reconnecting to that spirit. We have that in each of our cultures, in each of our understandings. 
The physicists, of course, you know, were stumbling rather clumsily on this, this knowledge through mathematics, through quantum physics, you know, string and particle theories, by smashing tiny particles together at very high velocity accelerators you know, all over the world. You know, Virgil spent some time at Stanford's nuclear accelerator years past. You know, so it's not a new concept. You know, these ideas of smashing particles, looking for something that connected all of us together. Last year, July of, 2000, uh, July of 2012, one of those very huge accelerators in Sweden. And these physicists discovered a microscopic particle. They call it the Higgs boson particle. This particle was the first discovery that matter could be created from nothing. And they look at it as a means of connecting all of us, that how we all come together through matter. It was duped the God particle, of course, by Christians immediately jumping on it, but it's spirit, as we understand it. It's a connecting particle. From nothing, there is matter. Never before. And, of course, these physicists, maybe 10 of them, had a great celebration. And it wasn't brought to too much awareness. You know, gradually over the years, Higgs boson theory becomes more critical in understanding how things are all fit together and how things can be created from nothing. Connectivity. Connectivity of everything, of every matter on Earth has now been discovered scientifically. It has been a mainstay, a principal philosophical understanding of indigenous philosophies and religions throughout the world since time immemorial. They give us their stamp of approval. Those conversations in the 90s become to fruition. There is reason why quantum physicists and indigenous thinking have some similarity. And there is some reason to give to native spirituality now in social transformation. That we can move these concepts of collectivity forward more aggressively as peoples. Ironically, this finding happens in time and history when the native process of knowing the native understanding of, of how we are connected is being lost in all, many of our communities through a prolonged process of sustained acculturation. Our understanding of vision questing, our understanding of medicine making, our understanding of knowing how we are connected is being replaced, being replaced by contemporary knowledge and we are losing that connection. So, how do we get in the game? You know, how do we put together a team to get in the game? You know, I think the first and primary thing that we need to begin to re-envision that process of knowing, that process of vision questing. And many of you, you know, we've supported Northern Cheyenne going to, to, to Bear Butte, you know, a lot of that thinking is already happening in our communities, but it's happening by a select few people. You know, how do we get in the game is do we encourage our spiritual leaders to teach us how to do that, how to make that process more available to our communities. You know, if we're going to do some constructive organizing, we need to organize a process to educate our own people on how those vision quests happen. And through that process of, 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 of seeking that knowledge, through prayer and fasting and meditation in the mountains, we come to know 
We don't need a dogma to tell us this is how it happens. By going through the process, we know it is true and we know it is happening. We know we are connected. And that's how oral traditions have continued for generations and generations, not by putting it in a book, by actually getting out there and doing it, getting out to the mountains and praying. And, and I challenge you that in terms of our need, in terms of how we get in the game, you know, that is a step to get in the game. If there is going to be social transformation at the magnitude that needs to happen within our lifetime, there has to be a process to doing it. And, you know, most unlikely alliance with, with subatomic physicists, but, you know, I think it's a step in the right direction. So thank you, and, and I know I ranted a little bit and got off my notes here and there, and, and, uh, but I didn't talk about creation theory. Uh, so thank you very much.